Yes, we did. I just want to thank you guys so much for coming and uh, being part of this. As you know, or maybe perhaps you don't, sheep has been a major commodity for the world. And what is so interesting about this is sheep actually changed the course of civilization. We may not realize that just because of, you know, dogs or horses. But what happened with sheep, sheep has decided to come into the picture at 900 BC. Okay, we're just, is that, is it? I can't quite read it. There we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. So this, of course, is, is me with my bum lamb. And I was interested so much in that just because then it put go to the next. <laughs> <laughs> so the moose bond sheep were actually the first one that was domesticated. And it was nine. 900 BC, when the Scythians over in the stands actually went ahead and uh, domesticated these sheep. But I do want to start out with a poem that I found by Robert Francis. From where I stand on the sheep, the, stand, the sheep stands still, as stones against the stony hill. The stones are gray, and so are they. And both are weather worn and round, leaving the eyes back to the ground. Two mingled flocks, the sheep and the rocks. And still no sheep stir from its place or lifts its Babylonian face. So sheep were even before the uh, the Western civilization. And so they have changed, actually, like I said, the course of history. The Scythians, what were they? Scythians were well before um, Mongols and the Mongolian people. And it's, they come from the Iranian stock. And how we figured there's so much discrepancy of actually how this happened that in way back then we don't have the written words, but the Scythians actually were found in a grave. And what was interesting is they were able to do some DNA. They were also able to figure out how long it was. And as far back as they could figure is the move on, maybe perhaps they got one that was the docile, decided to catch it, baby it, feed it, and then catch more, and then that's how they went ahead and they became a domesticated breed. But what happened was, is there a hair sheep? With mm -hmm. hair sheep, so of course there's nothing to spin, but they went ahead and they milked them, they used the skins, they also used absolutely everything. So the nomadic tribes actually were nomadic just because they had to follow the food source. <laughs> Well, because of the, the domestication of this, they had to have marketplaces. Marketplaces means that they absolutely had to have a place to be able to come and figure out where that they could have the exchange, because it's a stock exchange. Hmm. So, so what is so interesting about this is so then the nomadic people could actually stay in one spot for X amount of time. They didn't have to go and follow the herds, follow where the food was, so they could just go ahead and stay there. So then it was also called soups, or they were the selling the stock, the stocks. Horse and the dog and the sheep, they made it like a lot easier on the nomadic tribes. The wide steps, and then they no longer needed to be mobile, hence the Mongolian bears. Gears are another word actually for Mongolian gears are actually another word for years. So then we bring the Mongols. 
So the, the Scythians and the Mongols did not get along. Of course, James Khan was extremely mobile, extremely nomadic. So then with these years, he went ahead and he conquered all of this country. So because of that, they were able to put these bears that are all made of wool. They were all mobile. They put them on large carts. They were able to just make a swap through. They had they could bring their families. I've been over Mongolia and I was actually able to be inside one of these carted years. They would have eight, maybe 10 horses, oxen by then that they would use. They were called yaks, is what they would use. And so then that's how they were able to sweep through. So then what is so amazing now is how did, how did they get to America? All of that many times that year ago. So the first sheep actually came to the United States in the 15th century. And they came by Spaniards, they came from the South. They came on the ships. And what was so amazing is it was the Marinos. And the Marinos were such an amazing animal with their very, very thin wool. That's what I have on right now in Duckworth. Duckworth is an American made and Montana made company. Wear wool. We'll get into that in a minute. But <laughs> have wool, will travel. So the Marino sheep were so sought after that they were actually brought over hence to be extremely protected. But what happened is they did not actually take off here in the Americas. So the Native Americans down there in New Mexico, the Spaniards, then they were the first ones who actually went ahead and made the proper rule. What they did with this over in the stands in, in Cyprus, they finally, after 1,500 years, figured out how to make the wool work for them. Softer sheep, then they kept breeding. So it took that long in order to get all of the, the wool as we see it today. There is about 60 different types of breeds here in America. There's 100 different breeds over in all of Europe and the world. So the reason we only have we only have 60 is because of the different territories that we have and the different types of terrain. So you go down south, you need definitely the smaller, more resilient sheep because of the heat. We have the arid sheep more up here. And so therefore we have domesticated the sheep and they're all um, dispersed throughout. <laughs> So I was blessed enough when I was writing in Mongolia to be able to, I have not taken this, I can't take credit in this picture, but it takes them months and months, kind of like child drives in Montana, from Texas to Montana. It took them months to get their sheep to the market. Mulan, the tar, like the Oklahoma stockyards or even the Denver stockyards, are one of the largest markets. But it doesn't take that many shepherds. It only takes four shepherds for 2,500 head of sheep. They're more mellow. They're very calm. So if you're calm, they're going to be calm. So there really isn't a whole lot to be told and written things about the sheep. You know, not a lot of songs. <laughs> are about the sheep or it's all about the cowboys and you know blah blah black sheep you can't really be seeing them to uh to a bunch of 2500 dead sheep so but there is this peruvian sheep herder over in the gravelies and he'll sit there hmm. literally on his sheep wagon and he'll play his um saxophone every time wow it's, it's really neat. It's it's a sight to be seen. So um, sheep herders are more mellow. They didn't need to. They're more lonely. You know, it's just one of those zen animals. And so they're not. 
my son was here a couple of days ago and uh, he looks out the window and he goes, Mom, I think we got a sheep out. It's up there, so it's a ram, a buck, soon to dad, not time to breed. He were to drop, open the door, and we go out there and try to get him all, get him all contained back into the corral. Well, um, Apparently, my son is cowboy prior to life, and he jumps in the ring, slides down the driveway, and what does he do? He pushes the sheep up and over in the weeds. <laughs> so that was not a bad moment. <laughs> and 20 minutes to get this sheep in, get all of them put back in, separate them. I'm screaming. <laughs> he's yelling at me he's telling it's all about you mom and I said no it's all about the boat sheep <laughs> Beth was still in the house drinking coffee she said there's no way I can do this <laughs> so to make a long story short we did we did get the ram brought back in as soon as my son and I walked out of the crown it was as if nothing happened we closed the gate to the negative. All is taken care of. I don't know if I'm going to be running two or three views out. And <laughs> I'm sure that discussion will be brought back up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite the experience, but it's really neat. You know, it is definitely a bonding experience. Um, I have people here in the audience that help me every year, and it is one of the most incredible bonding for people to come and cheer sheep, cheer sheep, and just be a part of the community. It's a dying art. It's a dying breed. Um, the majority of the people here are actually women who are sheep herders, just because they are a lot more mellow. You know, men have a tendency to um, jump in grapes and chase rams out of <laughs> so I want to kind of give you a little bit of lowdown of some of the terminology of sheep dung. So the gestation period is 152 days. That's five and a half months. So you can actually determine when to put your rams in to when the weather will actually be decent enough to be able to lay them out. I have over 80 ewes myself. I lamb out most of the time by myself. I do get in a barn and then I do call people. But for the most part, when you are in sync with the animal, you don't need a lamb out. So the sheep terms, you, E W E, a ram or a buck. A lamb is a baby. Lamb. Planning season, that's the one that I just told you about. That's when the U itself gives birth. Shearing. So back in the 1800s, they didn't have electricity. And some of the Peruvians, some of the Basques, these are extremely, extremely sharp. So that's what they would cut the fleet with. And it's almost, if you go to Australia or you watch some of these New Zealand shows, they can actually cut as fast mm -hmm. as they can shore a view as fast with one of these as they can literally with an electric shearing team. So docking, banding. So I don't dock, but I band. And what happens is if you get you get fly blocked if you don't dock or cut the tail off some of these lambs. This is an elasticator bear. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is, if you're by yourself, you put the lamb in between, you grab the little tail, and you pull the tail through, and there is enough and the bone, and you want to put it right below the bone. And what that does is then it'll cut circulation off all of the tail, and then it'll eventually fall off. Is that humane? It's more humane to do this than it is to take a series rod 
and sear the tail off because this way you can keep more, you can keep track. What happens is when you sear that off, you can get flies, but you also uh, dock them with iodine. So any questions about So, and then what I do is I tag all of my ewes and my sheep, my lambs. So this here is what I go ahead and I do with the, uh, the ear tags. The reason they're blank on the other side is I put the ewes number on here and usually the dates. That way, if I have a predator or if the lamb is sick, then I can get the ewe and the lamb in together and the different colors are also male or female. So this is really, really important to have. And what this does is, since this is an obsolete tag, you put the ear in here, you pull down on that, and that stays. So I don't know a sheep herder who doesn't have this. They also have their own uh, mechanisms or their own way of keeping track of their numbers. Some of them have numbers, of course, already written on here. Sometimes the date, the year, and also on the back, sometimes they have the ranch on there when they have these bigger bands in case they crawl fences and they get into um, other people's bands and then this way they can tell. Now, also another way of distinguishing my sheep and the numbers on the tag and the numbers on the use <laughs> if I dip this in sheep paint. So all of these numbers correlate with the ear tag. And then the ear tag itself is the same number for the lamb as the you. These are old. These were actually my dad's. And I'm not sure where dad got these because we have had these never, I've never not had these. And sometimes weather is so unpredictable. I don't land inside a barn very often. So I go out there in the middle of the night. Sometimes the land is wet, cold, the wind is howling. And I put a little jacket on. <laughs> and when they're cold and they're miserable, and you can see they just lean into that. And, and so, of course, we don't have pink ones, but they've got red and they've got blue. And I see Kirsten and Aynar, they go out there and they go, oh. <laughs> And sometimes it is so cold for so long that they outgrow these. So, and then also, another way is also the marker paint. So what happens when a ewe passes away? Or maybe they have, they don't have enough milk or they have triplets. So these are nipples. And so what I do is we have um, powdered milk, goat milk. Sometimes the cows themselves are able to go over the neighbor. And I can put this in the bottle. And then you just put this on, you sniff this, and then you will never get rid of on land. They'll follow you around. And then sometimes, um, what's fortunate for me is I have a niece and a nephew that love that, and they can put them on my hands a little bit. And then the sad thing is, they act them back. They don't know me, they yell and <laughs> at the gate. <laughs> wait, wait for Kirsten to come back. <laughs> so, that is that. And then the bell itself. What I do is because of predators, I have sheep bells. And also not just on the use, but I have them on weathers. Weather is a castorated male that I keep because he's usually the the lead. I have a lead you, but I also have a lead weather. I shape the bucket and I compare them. I can find out where they're at, even though I don't have a lot of property, but still that really helps me quite a bit. So is there money in sheep? Well, there used to be. <laughs> so it's more of it's more of a love of the land, more of a love of the animal itself. Um, but 
there was in 2020 a textile sheet that went for four hundred and ninety thousand right. dollars. Yeah, no kidding. Unbelievable. I'm not gonna switch brands, breeds just because of that, but um that was just one of the uh, one of the deals too. Oh, I guess we're on the slideshow. What breed was that? Textile? No, that textile. Yeah, that's what it was. It didn't go textile. Yeah, and they're really muscular and they almost look like a bulldog. I mean, they stand there and they're just full, full on muscle. It's really bizarre. I lying when I have failed. <laughs> so this is a neat, this is a neat photo. This actually came to me um, through Karen. Karen found this for me as we were going through some of these little pictures down here. And this is my grandfather's, grandmother's, grandfather's grand sheep. Had a stroke, took, took these pictures, and that's actually what these are, are Havistro pictures. And if you don't know Havistro, you'll have to come to the, one of the talks that they'll be doing, and they'll probably talk about who Havistro was. He was the brother-in-law of Friar John, John Sam. No, I lied. No, Harbor. Harbor. Oh, Harbor. Yeah. But Har Havistro was in business with John Fryer. John Fryer's family. So, yeah, yeah, it's really, there's so many um, correlations to, mm -hmm. to this valley. It's unbelievable. So, the sheep itself didn't take off until the 1860s. Now, I don't know if you guys know that Montana was not founded east to west. It was founded from west to east. And the reason for that is because the the uh, gold rush down in Oregon and Washington or in uh, California, everybody was going to the Oregon Trail. So what did they do? They all went to the Oregon Trail. They brought sheep over there from the Spaniards and headed west. So when we found gold here in Montana, then the sheep, 1,500 head of sheep came from two men over there near um, the bit road. And that's how we were able to get sheep over here. But what was interesting about that is they were a lot easier, less expensive, and they were easier to butcher. They took the sheep and went to the bull mines. So, yep. So it was John Bishop and Richard Reynolds. And then what they did is then they moved to Miles City. So Miles City had a lot more land, a lot more, it, it was open. It was the act of 1934 that they actually were able to uphold the, what is that called, the um, homestead, when they homesteaded. But then the land was opened in 1909 to 1917, and homesteaders then came in droves. And it was on, on the open range, and the cattlemen were not happy about that. So, but then the winter of 1886 fully banished so much cattle that the cattlemen themselves were cute. So if you want to make money, it's not out there real cheap. I'm wondering if you want the status, have cows. So, so it was really, really interesting. So, yeah. but like I said, the sheep cared quite well. And so there was 30, 350,000 head of sheep that were driven from California here to Montana. And then at that time, there were 600,000 head of cattle. 500 head of sheep. So, but at that time, Texas was the largest population of sheep. There was 4,264,000, but in 10 years, it dropped to 1.4 million. <laughs> but Montana increased to 2,350,000, but seven years, it went to 4.2 million. It peaked at 6 million. And the open dry land opened to settlers in 1921, and then it dropped back down to 2 million. 
And the reason that it did is due to the land opening range, the uh, availability, and then the cattle and the sheep contention happened. So I did a little bit of research. I don't know if there were any sheep and cattle wars here in Park County. I haven't been able to dig, but I did dig about one massive massacre. It was with John Kendrick, and he had the largest cattle ranch. <laughs> he also started the Montana Stock Growers. And he lived over there by Hayden Creek, which is near Ashland, Montana. And then Robert Selway. And what they did is Robert Selway did both of these men had a massive ego. And then they chant and with Selway, he challenged the old standard. So tempers grew, sheep came in, sheep herders came in, cattlemen got angry because of the good old boy society. This is our land. We've always been here. This is the way it's always been. But the sheep herders actually have the law on their side. <laughs> that didn't happen. Hmm. So with, with the tempers growing, there are signs posted all over Mile City, all over Ashland, probably here, but I can't guarantee that. And it says, don't bring your sheep to Powder River. If you do, bring your coffin. You're going to need it. <laughs> so, December 28, 1900, it's called the Bear Creek Raid or Slaughter on Otter Creek. Hmm. There's a book written about it. I did a talk over in Hardin. Hardin's cattle. I'm a sheep herder. <laughs> You don't think I was nervous? <laughs> Indian country and cattle country, it's just like, oh, and so then I talked about it, this slaughter on Otter Craig. So there was mad contention. They warned these, these cattlemen, these cowboys went ahead. They, they did everything that they could to stop the sheep herders. Didn't happen. Sheep herders just kept coming. So December 28th, 2,113 head of young, unbred ewes were brutally attacked by 10 men. Hmm. They were on horseback, they had clubs, it took them 10 hours to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ego. You know, sheep herder won't back down, cowmen won't back down. And that's what happened. Hmm. So that's that's actually where the cattle and the men war, men uh, sheep people happened. Johnson County Wars. You probably heard about that. This was actually the first one that it happened. It was such a hush hush. Paid they paid their cowboys so well to keep their mouths shut. Nobody knew about it until the late forties. Mm -hmm. Not so most of the people were already gone. Hmm. So they had heard rumor, but nobody said anything. But they never killed any. They didn't even kill a dog. They just killed the ewes to just to make a point. Mm -hmm. So then Johnson County heard about this. They were not excuse. That's when sheep herders died, hmm. that's when cowboys died, that's hmm. when dogs died, hmm. thousands of sheep. So that's that's very very sad transition. But what also happened in December, cold, miserable, right there on the Cheyenne Indian Reservation, the best year that they were able to do in the years. Hmm. They came with their wagons. They came with their horses. They loaded up all of those those slaughtered animals. Took them back to camp. They had an incredible feast. Probably dried it. Mm -hmm. So that's. One yeah. thing that came out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's see where that is. How much time do we have? Whatever. <laughs> okay, so now um we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh Park County people. Actually, let's let's lift the mood a little bit from all this. Yeah. 
What paperwork does elderly sheep need? Your last wool that you can send them. <laughs> yeah, after that, oh, I thought, I thought, all right, maybe we better have a last, last flow. Um, you probably have heard about the harvests. Everybody knows about harvest flat. Do you guys, does everybody know about harvests and harvest and lilies and how instrumental they were with the sheep business? So they came, uh, John came at Clark City well before Livingston was ever founded. And he first raised cows, but got into the venture in 1900 of raising sheep. He had modest holdings to begin with. He only started with 1800 sheep. And before the harvests were at their peak, they leased, owned, and had permits for the forests for 100,000 acres. They got up to 25,000 head of sheep. So this is, as you see, these are the harvest sheep. And this here is one of their leases up. Probably up, oh, I shouldn't say, I don't know. I lied. I don't know what to say. Next slide. Oh, nope. Back. So we won't. We'll just keep on that one. <laughs> so uh, what, is, what is so amazing about the way that he was, that it was actually the brothers that increased the herd so much. And then they sold out in 1953. So then the Bottler Ranch. Have you guys heard about the Bottlers? Okay. You guys will eventually. These guys were incredible. So Frederick and Josephine Butler, AKA Josephine Shorthill. Shorthill Cemetery, have you guys heard about Shorthill? Okay, that's the correlation. So they had one of the first ranches, largest ranches down there in Paradise Valley. It's down there by Deep Creek, or by um, Big Creek, in that whole area right down there. And what is so amazing with that is they decided to, before they got into sheep, they took Hayden on the expedition to the Elton mm -hmm. Park. Mm -hmm. And because of that as well, they got furs, they hunted, then they brought them all back, and that's how they actually made a living. They're, they did so well with all of that exploration in Yellowstone Park, that they made a 21 room hotel right down there at Father Springs. Hmm. That burned, hmm. as most of those big places did. So, oh, this is when they came. They came in 1868. And then when Yellowstone actually closed for hunting, then they got into sheep in 1893. So I haven't found out how many um, acres they had as of yet, I don't know how many sheep. So that's another clip. So then there's the, the dark, the dark history sheep. So what was so interesting about the darks, they were over on the trail grid. So if you go down eight mile, do you know where eight mile, Old Yellowstone Trail? There, thanks to Audrey, Audrey was able to I just pulled in all kinds of resources. So between Lynette and you, and, and there's a rock out in the middle of the field, which I wasn't able to get up here on the, on the uh, slides. But it tells about, he was an incredible sheep, sheep man. And he had over 3,000 head of sheep. He met his wife um, well before that, but then there was, there was a bunch of people that actually helped him and I did find out that one of the sheep herders did die and he did get killed, and that was on the Laura branch. And the cowboys killed him because of his sheep skin. Mm -hmm. And then there's Charlie Bear. Even though he's not from here, everybody knows about Charlie Bear. Charlie, at one point, had a clip, which means wool, of over a hundred, no, 
but can we hold on? 1.5 million pounds of wool. Wow. He owned 300,000 head of sheep. He was thought to be the most, he held the, the most sheep in actually the world at one point. And in fact, it is going so well over where they're the Charlie Bear Museum. I don't know if you guys know where that is. So they have not only a museum about him, they also have a kids come in and they do service for them, and then they're able to write a paper. And whoever gets it, are, they have a full ride, four year scholarship through the bear. The bear women, you probably heard of them in Billings. They didn't have any children, they didn't have any, any heirs. So that's why the women are the main um, Navy scholarships. So some of the other names that you probably have heard of here in the Valley, Smith, Briggs, Harvick, Guy Hunter, and he has a park sheep. Okay, this is North Spangler. North Spangler, I was actually able, when I was a really little kid, my dad would talk about him, and he actually came over the rare 20 times. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and flip to the next one. So, this is my place here, called the Barely A Sheep. People move into the community and they go, ah, oh, got rich. <laughs> They've got three acres. Well, my barely sheep ranch because I only have about 80 head sheep. So it's really not a ranch. And I barely have enough sheep to keep food on the table. But this is sharing day. And it takes a lot of people, like I said, to make the clipping of the sheep. This is kind of I said. And my nephew, Anar. There's Dane, my son, Amos, and then some of the other boys that just come in and help. Like I said, it is a big community that I'm allowed to be able to uh, share this day with. And then, and that's the wool. And what we're doing is we're skirting. So sometimes when they get green grass, there's a bunch of poop around there. To get a better price for the fleece, you have to clean that off. And that's what we're doing there. Hmm. Okay. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. So this is a Lincoln long wool. And if you put your nose into it, it smells like fruit. <laughs> it's not that normal sheep full of lamb smell. Even though when I do get more, they do open the window. So I <laughs> <laughs> but you can see some of the lamb on the fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we'll go to the next one. So this here is this is just some of the um, wool bags that is coming down off of the Alpire Ranch, and it's in the early days of operation of the harvest. And the sharing crew went around to various ranches, and the sharing was done with hand blades, which I just showed you. He's sitting like. When Hankins started working at the Harvest, the sharing plant at the home ranch was up the draw and back with the flat about three miles from the house. All the sharing was done there by hand, where Mormon crews who would come in and 16 to a crew. A good sheep shearer could do easily 80 a day by themselves, which is insane. Mm -hmm. They could shear just as fast they do with the electric clippers, and they they need to keep the, the blades just as sharp as a razor. And sometimes they didn't have have to close them just to run them through, but they had to be awfully careful not to cut a sheep. Mm -hmm. So that does happen. So they have a sewing kit right next to them. Oh wow! So to get tired, sheep moves. They're too fat, they can't get into the folds of the sheep. And so then they do is then they stitch it. And it's it's like a rug needle. And they just sit there and they just start stitching that up. And within four days, you wouldn't know. She can feel it. And this is 
what it looks like today. I just brought some of my um, wool in. They're packed in bales like this. Wool is a commodity. And when wool is a commodity, you're kind of at the mercy of what the price is. Right now, because I've got long wool Lincoln, it's only 10 cents a pound. 10 cents. Therefore, it's stockpiled in my sheep shed. Now that I've met Helen, we had some different ideas. So maybe we can get something going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you shear sheep, it's really important because if you don't shear sheep, then they get, they get maggots, they get overheated and they die. So a lot of people who aren't familiar with good, good things to do with their sheep, they think that it's mean. They don't think that it's humane. It's more inhumane not to share them. <laughs> so, how come we don't have sheep, lamb on our table anymore? It's been happening quite a while. So, it was actually in, let me see, we have notes. I should look at So it just wasn't predators that actually hurt sheep. It was because of the Oh, I can do this. I'm just about there. <laughs> Okay, here it is. Beyond popular belief, it wasn't the cattlemen that decimated the, the sheep industry. I'm not shaming you. Very much. Rayon, Vortex, polyester, and World War II men coming back from the war. And they had enough um, they had had enough of the boiled lamb. That's all that they ate over there. It was disgusting. So, and then to the next one. <laughs> so, you have to have good practices and you really fall in love with sheep. This is Dory. Dory is an autistic sheep. What happened was she got into a meat that was fermented and she became autistic. She had a brain fever. Hmm. She was going into convulsions. She was frothing at the mouth. I called all of the old timers over over near my city. All of them. They didn't know what to do. So I do a mail route, throw her in the bottom of my car, and off we go. And I am just stuffing her with all kinds of antibiotics. Well, this is Dory. <laughs> And Dory did become autistic. She doesn't know that she's a sheep. And so when she runs, she's flat-footed. She chases things. Aww. And then all of a sudden she'll stop and forget what she's doing. And then I call her and she'll come and run. Well, and I'm also able to dress her up. This is the Halloween cartoon <laughs> and I was trying to win on um, KGLT, but apparently they don't think that um, a bumble sheep <laughs> was cool enough. So a horse with a unicorn was coming out. So, okay, and then the next one. So, I'm Helen Harris, and I love weaving, I love fiber, and making it work together with agriculture. Um, and because of that, I became an advocate for the Montana Fiber Shed and worked close with them in trying to uh, bring fiber practice, best fiber practices back and with a focus on the community and regenerative uh, um, 
So I'm going to talk about fiber. Okay. So this is me at my room, and I'm working on a piece. I do a lot of wall pieces, and I do a lot of hand manipulation. Um, just to let you know, the first time I ever met a sheep was in 1978 when I was in college. And it was in Hampshire, and it was very rough the wool. And the yarn we had in our weaving room was all very rough wool. And so when I moved to Montana, I was so happy to find Marino and then find a bunch of And I, I'm just so glad it's here. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, my studio is down in Ennis, outside Ennis, along the Madison Range of the Rockies. Um, I do not raise sheep. We have horses. But I've been involved in fiber for most of my life. Okay. So just thought I'd show you working hands. I'd love to work with my hands and the feel of the natural fibers. And I don't use just fiber from sheep or other, you know, cotton, flax, or you know, linen or that those fibers. I also use the inner bark of a um, cottonwood tree or um, just other fibers I can find my like bed grasses and um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I use a lot of deer hide or elk hide for specially harvested and um, for those of my work as well. And I love designing pieces. I, uh, when I get ready to work on a piece, I set out my yarns, creatively compose. These are all wool yarns um, I was using to make uh, a couple of those bags. And then I also have, you know, full bouquets full of yarns, just color coordinated and ready to go when I start to spin it up. These are a few of the pieces that um, I have created, and they all have a story to tell. So when I'm beginning to design a piece, I'm thinking about, okay, what what do I need to know? What words come to, to my mind while I'm weaving? And I write all this down, and in the end, I put together a story that, for instance, the third piece over is a wall piece, and I'm telling you the story of the thoughts I had while I was reading. And it, it just really makes me that next piece. Um, so these are some of the pieces, and there's some of this there over there. The moccasins, I was work, I worked with Donna White there. She's a Native American, a Native American American up. And she has a, a studio over in Bozeman and she makes boxes out of Iceman. And then I was getting a pair made and I asked her if I could have make my fabric, pack my fabric on the moccasins. And she was using a Hendel pin uh, bed stock and she said, yeah. So now I do custom fabrics for her. Um, and then the second one, um, that was a wool vest I made for our fashion show, which we'll talk about later. And uh, there's another woman in Bozeman who uses um, bison and um, makes products from them. She gets bison and, and takes some of the Native, some of the Native Americans when they go to hard stuff. And so she, that was like a collar and, and balls on it, like, you know. Work well with that, and it's extremely warm. I can make the next one. So I think I mentioned that I was part of the Montana Fiber Shed. I was one of the founding members, and so the goal of the Fiber Shed is to connect Montana to the Montana Fiber, not just giving them fiber, providing the fiber, but also telling the story of, um, you know, how to get how to get the fiber but how to, what we can do with it, how we can engage the community with fiber and kind of bring back some of the mills and, and increase the pieces of equipment, the availability of equipment to do weaving. There are no weaving, you know, big commercial weaving done here. It's all multi-done on these posts. But we're trying to bring some things out this way to give people a chance 
the funding of the that are right here. And and also to the, the mills we have here are small. They just do, you know, they were like eight, ten months out and you take a lease to them. And a lot of them like they won't spin singles like this, which is what I like to do to make it very fine as we make the fabric. Let's move on to the next slide. So part of our mission, though, is to, um, it's a grassroots nonprofit that supports our Montana-based natural fiber and dye system. So it's basically sheep and it's, um, natural dye plants that are found out here, as well as other. We seek um, to encourage new and strengthen existing systems and to do so in a generative and sustainable way that supports the health of our people, our soil, and the landscape. Move on. So we're a locally grown is really important to me, um, as well as to a lot of other people and um, that are involved in that fiber trade. And I think in other parts of the community, it's really becoming popular. Um, so we're wearing locally grown is better for us, it's better for our communities and our local economy. Because the price of cheap wool has helped drastically drop. You know, we really want to help people, encourage people to start wearing wool, and, and that also helps the price of the ranchers. Most of the fiber grown in the U.S. travels over 6,000 miles before returning to us as wearable garments. And wearing Montana grown helps keep the jobs and dollars here. And those two uh, pieces right there, if you go back to Washington, those were some that uh, Laura found for me in a picture, and they are humongous. <laughs> <laughs> they are not normally that big. <laughs> okay. So another reason to wear wool is you can reduce your carbon footprint. You turn grass into wool, wool is fifty percent carbon, and you get a sweater and a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. Your carbon is captured. It also can be conscious. So because it lasts forever, it's going to be a long time before it goes into the top of the class. Okay, the next. So once again, this is kind of the soil to soil concept that um, the fiber shed um, embraces as well as other um, groups throughout the state. Um, so you're, you have sheep, cotton, fast fiber, and dyes, and um, they are processed into you know, the clothing and home goods and other fabrics that are necessary. Um, and then this is the designers make it, and then the design, the designers cut it out into the products. So the garments then are, are made and they can be recycled and um, composted, as I said, and then applied to the pants and farm line. And then the cycle starts all over again. So it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to introduce you to a few um, of our producers, mills, makers, and yard shops. You know, once again, we're grassroots, trying to make connections, and we're talking about the stewardship of the land. Okay. So producers. And then they should be, okay, let's see, let's go on the next one. I think we most people will talk there, the issue frame. Florida Mark is one of our new producers, and he, um, Raises sheep, okay, and then go ahead and keep going. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. And that was one there we go. <laughs> Another one is um, Douglas Clothing. It's the Helen Randy Ranch, and they grow a lot of wool. They um, are out in Dillon, Montana. You see their products in town. Mm -hmm. um, however, they're not made here, and that's another problem because we don't have facilities to scour the wool. And we thought the fabric and and then make it into the, the garments that they have. Uh, most of their production is done in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So it is in the US, it hasn't been shipped overseas yet. They sell it at some sell do they sell it here? I think that's still selling um over their offices. So we have um, several mills in the area, but like I said, they're small. Um, the Montana will run out with hard well, and they're the ones that spun this um, single um, yarn. Mm -hmm. And then there's 
the Bull Hill and Belgrade. Um, they do a lot of, uh, they try to cater more to knitters, but they do a lot of food fly. They also are incorporating bison into their yarn smell. Mm -hmm. um, and also dyeing some of indigo and doing a mixture. Mm. So the new mill um, that is up in Kalispell, but I don't know the name of it yet. And um, that was sort of the area there because a lot of those people book tar fairs in Alberta. So this closer to them. Mm. And then the Mountain Meadow will um, mill in Buffalo, Wyoming. I have not been there, but they have recently really expanded. I'm not mm. being dying. And do more scouring the facility is bigger. So, mm. um, that's the um, uh, yes. Mom's can makers. I just wanted to introduce you to a couple other makers. Allison Groach is a beaver and fiber artist, artist that was found in Montana. And she uses uh, wool. She does a lot of tapestry work and does uh, her own natural dyeing. And this is Madeline Keller King. She's a knitter, natural dyer, and everything fiber. She um, is a knitter. I don't. She doesn't knit, and she um, dyes with all kinds of things. She had, attends all the festivals and sells her work. And during the winter months, like uh, January and February, our fiber shed has it's called a wool one, and it's on Zoom, and you can join in. Madeline uh, runs those sessions, and she'll come up with either a new sock pattern, a knitting pattern, or a hat this year. And she will walk you all through it, and, uh, and then we bring in a speaker and talk while everybody's sitting there and doing knitting. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have about five yarn shops that are totally, you know, pretty much have a lot of yarn and carry a lot of our producer of yarns. Um, the, uh, the Fiber LLC is a new one in Bayport, and the Daily Yarn Shop in Dillon is relatively new. And then Sticks and Bozeman, and uh, we do a stick of clothes in the yarn bar in Dillon. There probably are a few more, but these are the only ones that are actually known as a lot of shop right now. So we started the fiber shed, the Montana fiber shed, in 2000, about 2018. We started running our bylaws, becoming a nonprofit, and getting members and produce, you know, producers and everything involved. And our first event was a farm fashion show at the Emerson and Bozeman. And uh, we were going to do it in 2021, but due to COVID, we had to make it 2022. And so this is some photos from the fashion show portion. The girl in the middle had made a, a felted you know, a wool wrap, and she her inspiration was an antler of her dad's hmm. uh, a deer antler. And then we have a couple of wool sweaters and a wool dress and coat, and then. Like everybody be uh, you know to get a member if they want to join. Um, menu bar happy hour. That was an uh, initiative for this year, earlier this year, where we held several menu bars across the state, where we were just teaching people how to save, you know, where their clothes went longer. So this is an example mm -hmm. of some of them stitching. Look at that. Yeah. And. Um, and Collins are room and have rooms available for people to come in and be at their leisure and create their garments. It's something we're lacking. And you know, it's it probably won't be a huge loom, it might be several small looms. But at some point we'd really like to try to get products on big looms out here. They never were really out here, except I think there was there may have been one years and years ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, on the loom, it doesn't take me long, um, but I did cut five yards of fabric. And then, and I'm like kind of creating while I go, so it's hard to say. I probably could have done it in a few days. Um, 
And I had a woman out in Laurel who hand spun all this. So it starts with that. And she, and I used her because she was the only one that could spin it thin enough. So a hand spinner can do it a little bit better, you know. Better. And then I was designing it as I, I went. So I was, um, you know, trying to make sure I could get the legs thin enough, not like huge and how I could get this and how I could line it. But because this is like squishy, kind of, it was really hard on some of the seams to get it so it didn't you know, kind of fall apart. So I had to do a few workarounds on that. And then I didn't want to have to do buckles and stuff because I I wanted this to be all natural. So I did a deer hide, as Pima calls them, clown straps, <laughs> and, which are nice. And then, oh, but. Uh, we can't go after this. I think there's one more. Fooling ourselves is an agricultural practice. 